We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere. It's Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website. That way they don't get missed. They get logged. I get a notification. But I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Tonight, we have a question from local Sebastian Gaspar Woods, who earlier this year won Best Short Script at the Underground Indie Film Festival for his horror romance ghost story, Hold Me Close. Sebastian asks, as of 2020, what do you consider the best horror games? Well, thanks for the well-timed question, Sebastian. I know Sebastian's obviously a big-time horror fan, um, who is a local gamer that I haven't seen since March, unfortunately, someone I do enjoy gaming with often. Uh, he actually won one of our copies of Medium when we were doing the Medium giveaway, too. So horror games is another topic, like last week, that we have covered in the past, but this was way back, episode 14 of the podcast, Back when, you know, Sean didn't even have facial hair. No, he didn't even then. <laughs> we were no, my facial hair wasn't white, though. That's the problem. That's true. Sean, <laughs> Sean had, had much darker facial was, hair. Yeah. My, my hair was probably about the same. Um, but it was a long time ago. Our um, For one, our quality wasn't as good back then. Second, this is the kind of topic that I think is worth reviving uh, from time to time. Actually, being horror, I should say resurrecting from time to time. And I think this is especially true right now. Because as Sebastian noted, he wants to know, as of 2020, what are the best horror games? Well, a shockingly good number of horror games have come out in like the last three or four years. Games that didn't even exist when we last covered this topic. Now, you'll hear about a number of the games on our list tonight that we couldn't have mentioned before because they didn't exist. There's just It's like the year of good horror games. The last couple of years, 2018, 2019 especially. Well, and it's also worth noting that what is considered horror is also something we could yes. probably debate for years on end. Uh, but we've yeah, covered actually, a bit of a gambit here. so. And that is something that's going to come up when I get to the first game recommendation, because <laughs> there's a big fight over that one. So as usual, no particular order to this list, except for the order of me sitting down with a notepad file going, let me think of what horror games I like, uh, and then putting them down in that order. So maybe that means something. I don't know. If you talk to a psychologist, I'm sure it does. Um, I did try to include a number of different game types and games of various weights. So there should be something on this list for everyone. Well, once we get through our main recommendations, we'll have a number of honorable mentions that we will cover briefly and indicate why they didn't make the main list for us. All right, I am going to start off with one that is the most controversial game on this list, and that's going to be for purists who don't think this is based on a horror movie, and that is Jaws. Now, I don't want to get into the whole, is Jaws a horror movie? But what I do want to say is that it doesn't matter because this is an excellent one versus many board game. It's split over two parts, where the first part, the players are hunting the shark on the beaches of Amity Island, and then the second part, everything flips around, where the hunters become the hunted. This is a great example of just how good licensed games have become, and a great example of tying the theme of the movies to the mechanics. Like, this is a, 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 a blockbuster, in my opinion, by Prospero Hall. And even if you don't necessarily call it a horror, it's definitely got that thrill aspect uh, of, of the unknown. And, and that really fits into a lot of what Halloween is. And that was Jaws. Speaking of Prospero Hall, another big hit of theirs from this last year is Horrified. This is the board game featuring the Universal Monsters. It's a cooperative game where players are trying to save their city from one or more of the classic movie monsters. You're going to be facing off against Dracula, Frankenstein's monster, Steenstein, whichever it is, uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon, The Invisible Man, and more. Since it came out, this has become my go-to cooperative game and a great gateway game. This is the game I'd like to break out at public play events now to hook non-gamers because everyone knows the Universal Monsters. And then the mechanics of this game is so simple and everyone's on the same playing field because you're playing together. Horrified is a brilliant game. Personally, put away the pandemic, pull out Horrified. Absolutely, could not agree more. And that is Horrified. Now, the next is the most unique game on my list. Uh, this is one I could probably talk about for a whole show because it is so different from pretty much everything else out there on the market, and that is Nyctophobia. Now, this was created by a game designer who grew up playing games with their blind uncle, and they wanted to make a game 
where the uncle and every other player would be on the same playing field. And they did that by creating a game where all the players are blind. Nyctophobia is a one versus many game where one player plays a hunted trying to catch the hunted who are lost in the woods. The thing here is that only a hunter can see the board. All the other players are wearing blackout glasses and must move around the board using only their sense of touch to feel around and through talking to the other players to try to learn the map of the forest in their heads. This game presents a gaming experience like nothing else I've ever experienced. In, in 40 plus years of playing games, I've never played anything that plays like this. This is a totally unique game that is going to evoke feelings that you just can't get any other way. It's the same way like Dread revolutionized horror role-playing by adding actual tension. Like this, you get jump scares, you get the, the listening and the tension and all of the horror that you can't just get from a standard board game, card game, rolling dice. Yeah, no, I think the not only the concept of the game, which is so unique, but just the fa- the way that it, it evol- evolved and the way that she, that she developed this game or they developed this game uh, is so unique and, and interesting that it would make it an interesting game even if it wasn't for this whole horror aspect. And that is Nyctophobia. Next, I've got Exit the Haunted Roller Coaster. Now, besides being the perfect gateway to the Exit series, and I still say that and until they come up with a new one, I think I'll be saying that for some time. If you've never played an Exit game, start with the Haunted Roller Coaster. The theme in this one is perfect for Halloween. It's that perfect mix of spooky and silly where you have ghosts and zombies and creepy crawlies. It's it's that all-encompassing Halloween creepiness. There are other games with horror themes. One we're going to be reviewing later tonight. This one is the most accessible of them all. And it's the one that I think fits the Halloween theme the best. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I I, I love the fact that it's, it's not a true horror as much as it is the family Halloween experience, right? Yeah. It's got something for everyone in the Halloween spirit and not just, uh, let's see if we can freak people out. And that is Exit the Haunted Roller Coaster from Tames and Cosmos. All right. This is my strongest recommendation on the list for families. If you have kids and you are looking for something to do on Halloween or around Halloween, or if you're being responsible and staying home and not having to go door to door and possibly spread viruses, I recommend strongly Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion from the Op. Now, I mentioned this in our review last week. We are looking at Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion, not Betrayal at the something something (laughs) version of Betrayal House in the Hill. Um, that also has mansion in it this is a pizza box style game this is a escape room in a box style game it's a combination of puzzle based escape room and murder mystery tied together using the brilliant coded chronicles system from the bamboozle brothers my family loved this game like my kids yesterday we were playing the exit game and my youngest came up and said, can we play another mystery game? Can we play another mystery game? Like they were 100% sold on this game. They absolutely loved it. This is some of the best gaming experience we've had together as a family was playing the Scooby-Doo game. Yeah, no, I don't think we can say enough about the coded Chronicles system that they have come up with. And uh, well, we will be saying some more about it, but (laughs) it's a, it is, it is a system and this is just the first attempt at using it. Uh, And I have to say, they hit it out of the park with Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion. Next, we got the most expensive game on the list. The big fantasy flight, big box, lots of miniatures, tons of tokens, three rule books. Actually, I think it has less than that because it uses an app, but Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition. This is a uh, mythos-themed game. This is perfect for anyone who's into the whole Cthulhu mythos, elder god type of thing, and for people who like mysteries and puzzles. This is the first game to really highlight what you can do with an app, integrating it with a board game to create a new, better experience. This app allows you to investigate a mansion room by room finding puzzles, doing the puzzles physically on a tablet or on your phone, and trying to find out what's happening. And then once you find out what's happening, figuring out how to stop it or solve it or prevent the murder or everything else. Due to having an app, every game you play is unique and you never know when you start the game exactly what you're dealing with. 
One game, you'll be battling cultists. The next game, the mansion's on fire. And the last one, you have to find all the pieces of the ritual and cast a spell before the power portal in the attic destroys the universe. Plus, when you get expansions for this game, it automatically adds all the expansion content and just mixes it in with everything else. So it just suddenly there's new rooms that can show up or new monsters or new clues. It is an amazing example of what you can do with an app and a board game together. Yeah, no. And if, uh, you know, uh, we have talked about apps and, and games on, on this show before, and we'll leave that for somewhere else. But for this fantastic one that's available and working right now, you can get Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition. Next is Dead Man's Cabal. This one wins the uh, the award of the night for the game with the most unique theme. <laughs> I don't think anything's ever going to top this one for the most unique theme out there, but I, I love it. You play necromancers who have been invited to a party, they, and but you don't have any friends because you're a necromancer, so you need to resurrect some guests to bring with you. I, I like what cooler theme is there for a board game than that. Like, I, I honestly, and like for Halloween game night, especially if you're having a party, if you're having a Halloween party with board games, which right now may not be the most responsible thing to do, but on an average year, if you're having a board game party or game with parties, this is just fits, right? Like you're having the dance party at the party. There are some really interesting mechanics in this game. This is uh, definitely a Euro side of game, a, a, a thinker where you're a lot of planning ahead, a lot of strategy, has some great creepy components. Uh, your main component in the game is different colored skulls and the money you use are bones. Uh, just be sure, fair warning, read the rules for final scoring a couple times and make sure everyone understands them before playing because the final scoring is a bit opaque. Yeah, go ahead and, and check out our reviews on that game. Uh, if, you're, if you pick it up and uh, you'll, you might fa find some of those things that'll catch you up. And again, that is Dead Man's Cabal. Next, we have Legendary Encounters Alien. Now, unlike the Legendary Marvel series of games, the Legendary Encounters series are actually fully cooperative deck builders. The others are this weird mismatch of competitive and cooperative. This is pure co-op. You're going to play through the original series of movies. I think it's the first four. It might be the first three. Sorry, I didn't double check that ahead of time. I know you play for at least the first three. And with each movie being more difficult than the last. What I find most interesting in this game is the way it actually manages to invoke the feelings of tension that you get from the Alien series by having the adversary track with the aliens face down and you never know what it is until it pops up or until you're able to use your scanner to take a peek and you never know if it's just like some little face hugger you don't have to worry about or an alien queen. Like it does a fantastic job of that. Plus it's got the whole you can get impregnated with alien eggs and chest bursters and all the other alien stuff. The other thing it did is the encounter series did a great job of making the game more cooperative where you match symbols to be able to give other people abilities and cards. And the only way you're going to win this one is to cooperate. This does a fantastic job of capturing the feel of the alien universe in a card based format, which is not something I thought I think I would ever hear anyone say. So that is Legendary Encounters Alien. One of you, that's, that needs to add to the list of games for you to try when you're down in Windsor. I know yeah, I've still never done any of the Legendary in Encounters. Uh, you know, we made that decision early on that DC yeah. was the way we were going to go with my uh, for my son. And uh, I've just never ended up touching the Legendary Encounters yet. All right, Tragedy Looper. This is an, an anime-inspired one versus many game that is really unique and a little hard to describe. So I'm going to do the best I can. Um, this this almost is more unique than Dead Man's Cabal, but you can't beat Necromancer Dance Party. Um, one player is like a game master type idea role. Like they're running the game and the other players are moving around on a board and talking to people and it's very anime themed and you go see people and you do nice things to them and they feel happier. And then someone dies and then time resets. And you start playing again and the players have looped back in time and now have to prevent that death from happening. So they got play through it once to kind of see what happened. You're like, oh, whoa, the this whoever I don't remember any of the characters' names in the game. The the blonde girl died. So then they play through it again and they try to prevent the blonde girl from dying. And part of that is figuring out how they died, why they died, were they depressed? Did someone murder them? Why did someone murder them? And then they start playing through and they're talking to people and try to say and they die again. And then time resets. And you keep trying to do that until they eventually solve the puzzle. It is 
one of the most mechanically unique games I've seen. I will admit, though, it is not easy to learn. The tutorial takes a full two to two and a half hour gameplay just to get. And there is a lot for the game master role, which I can't remember what's called to focus on. And it's actually a player versus player. Like the game master is trying to prevent the players from preventing the murder. Like it's, it is a unique game. I, I'm sorry. I probably didn't do it the best service there trying to describe it, but what a unique experience. So it's mastermind is their term for the, the game master uh, mastermind versus one to three protagonists. Uh, and you can sort of think of it as a mystery version of Groundhog Day in yeah. anime form. Yeah. Uh, and that is Tragedy Looper. Next is Ghost Stories. This is a Fast and Furious Wuja-based cooperative game. Players are playing chi warriors trying to protect their village from an ancient oni, an ancient demon. They do this by battling ghosts, working together, and using the various abilities of the townsfolk to defeat their foes. This is an up to four player game from Antoine Bauza, and it is notorious, well known for its difficulty level. This is one of those games where if you go online and Google it, you are going to find people complaining about how hard Ghost Stories is or bragging about the fact they beat it. And that's the thing with this game is this is so hard to beat, but you always get so close. Like you always feel like there's that chance. And once you just beat it once, it is so rewarding. Like that, just that feeling of we finally did it. We beat Ghost Story. It's probably uneasy. And there are difficulty levels. You ever to get, get good at it. That is combined with a variable board layout. Like the town is a three by three grid and you can rearrange which buildings are where. The enemy monsters spawn through card play. So every game they're going to spawn in a different order in different places. And then the Oni, there's like eight different types of Oni in this game. It's awful at the beginning. You never know which one you're throw all that randomness and no game is ever going to be the same in ghost stories plus there's a ton of expansions out for this one which i admit i haven't even tried because the base game enough for me yeah there's actually 11 different expansions out <laughs> right now uh and uh just a note it's not actually a horror version but a adventure version a a, a fantasy version has been recently re-released it's uh, called last bastion which okay. is a uh, the re-implementation of ghost stories in a more fantasy save the castle rather than the Wuxia uh, ghost story version. But uh, okay. we're recommending for Halloween ghost stories. Up next, we've got Sorcerer. This is a two-player dueling card game. By dueling card game, I mean games like Keyforge, Magic, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, right? Two of you summon monsters who fight each other. This features some of the most twisted and dark artwork I've ever seen in a game. Like, this is a, a messed up, don't show your kids kind of artwork, you'll give them nightmares card game. The theme is two twisted and corrupted mystical beings are battling over Victorian London. So it's technically, it's a, a gaslight, you know, a steampunk kind of feel to it. You're going to send out and equip minions and battle over three fronts. The first player to burn down or destroy two of the three locations in London wins the game. This game features a really unique deck mashing mechanic where you build your character by picking three different things, your character's name, your domain and your lineage. And then you mash those three different decks together to get your deck to play with. So not the full deck construction of Magic the Gathering, but also not like preset decks like Keyforge. This is a really neat game. And this is probably my favorite dueling card game to come out since Magic. No, absolutely. Sorcerer is fantastic. But remember, we did say it's a two player game. Don't try and play it with any other combination of players. Two player only. And do be aware, there are a bunch of games out there with the name Sorcerer in the title. You are looking for just Sorcerer, nothing else, released in 2019. Uh, now, there are uh, additional deck packs and things you can buy for it. But just Sorcerer, not especially, you know, the 1975 Sorcerer, the game of magical conflict. Uh, <laughs> just Sorcerer. And they just recently kickstarted a new edition, actually, a whole new box set with all new stuff to go with it and yes the box does say i, I think it even recommends six players like it's yeah, no it's two, two player, player, player game. two player two game player game sorry sorry uh white wizard games it's a <laughs> two player game and that was sorcerer just sorcerer no other words just sorcerer from white wizard games that'll help too. look up white wizard games that'll help you find it 
All right, next we have another big box Cthulhu game. So I think Cthulhu just has to come in big boxes. You can't get small box Cthulhu games. No, actually, I can think of a couple. There's there's a list for us, the best big box and small box Cthulhu games. But another big one, kind of like Mansons of Madness, this is Cthulhu Death May Die. Instead of Fancy Flight, this one's coming from Cool Mini or not. Um, if you kickstarted this, you have the largest miniature ever made for a board game, which is the like three and a half foot tall Cthulhu miniature that actually works as the end board of the game. Um, I'm not lucky to enough to have done that, or I didn't have the money to do that. I don't know if there's luck involved or not. Um, this is a very different take on the Cthulhu mythos. This is a uh, two-fisted dice chucking Cthulhu where you play through set scenarios where your investigators are first trying to make a great old one appear corporeal and then kick its butt. Quite a different feel from most mythos games where you're trying to, you know, investigate and get all the clues and try to solve it. No, no, no. This is go beat up some cultists to get all the runes. Once you have all the runes, have Cthulhu show up and beat them up. I found that really refreshing. I had a lot of fun with this game. Now, I do admit, I wish this was more of a campaign game. Instead, you're just going to pick an act and you're going to pick an Elder God and put the two together and play. I would have liked some character progression, but overall, still a great, fun game with some fantastic miniatures. Yeah, and on, on, the, on the opposite side of, of Mo, who wishes that it was campaign, the benefit of the way it is, is that it's got this great mix and match where you can pull it out any time and say, hey, let's do Act 3 with this Elder God tonight. Cool, let's all play. Yeah. And you can. Uh, and so if, you know, Joe's down and he's never seen act six yet, great. You can jump in and do act six with whichever demon you want. And so that is Cthulhu death may die a very different take on Cthulhu yeah. games. All right. My final two recommendations tonight, we're going to aim for the younger audience. For those of you out there who have kids and children and want to play with Scooby-Doo should be down here with these two. Actually, Scooby-Doo belongs on this list. Though Scooby-Doo, I suggest playing it once you have kids that are definitely at reading age because it's more fun if they can read the books with you. Here's one that it actually can work as young as preschoolers, and that is Shaky Manor. This is a unique game from Blue Orange Games that features a bunch of different, like, cardboard boxes without a lid. I don't even know how to describe it. It's a segmented cardboard tray that's divided into eight different rooms, and each different room is a room in a, in a haunted manor. And in the rooms, you put in a bunch of components. And the components in this are really cute. There's like an eyeball that rolls around. There's a witch meeple. It's a plastic spider. There's all these like cute little board game components. You put them in and everyone's got the same matching stuff in their, their little mansion. And then you flip up a card and it's going to show a room with a set number of things in it. And everyone has to shake their manor to try to get their room to just have that stuff in it. It is really way more fun than that sounds like it is like as an adult i love this game this is way too much fun just trying to shake the stupid box around and of course because everything's made of different materials like of course the eyeball rolls everywhere the meeple's hard to slide the snake's even harder because has more surface area right like there's 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 more to it with the physics here but it's something even little kids can play with plus talk about toy horrific like this is one except for the fact you're probably going to lose some pieces the kids are going to love playing with even when you're not there yeah, I don't know. This is one of those ones that made me put it in that little, I don't know if it's Halloween horror concept at the top. I, I They've got some some Halloween theming in there, but it's it's a little on the edge. <laughs> I don't know. You got witches and eyeballs and a spider. To me, that's Halloween stuff. But that is Shaky Manor. All right, last one on the list. I'm going to finish this off with my favorite kids game that's ever been produced to date this one's great for older kids and to be honest i break this out if we were having a horror game night with all adults here i would still be breaking this out that is ghost fighting treasure hunters this is a cooperative game for four players where you play kids rushing into a haunted house in order to find and escape with eight gems you need to do this before the ghosts turn into haunts and overrun the house Players are going to have to work together, figuring out which gems to grab first, and balance grabbing gems with fighting back the encroaching ghosts. I have yet to find someone who did not enjoy this game, whether child, adult, everyone has fun with this game. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's just a fun game, and I, when it's out at the parties, adults go over to play it. Like, it's yeah. not one of those games where it's like, oh, I should go play with the kids. No, no, I want to go play Ghost Fighting Tiger Hunters. If there's a kid there, fine, whatever. I want to play Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. It's a great game. 
first time we played this was at a New Year's party because we had given it to uh, Big G for Christmas, I think it was. And she broke it out and we were all playing it. It was a way for her to take part on New Year's. And then when she went to bed, the game stayed out and kept being played till three in the morning. That was about five hours after my daughter went to bed. People were still playing Ghostbusters, Ghostbuster, sorry, Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. And it is worth noting, people have, uh, are talking about in the chat here, is there is a Ghostbusters Protect the Barrier variant of that. That. it is significantly cheaper does have a cooler theme note it is the female ghostbusters the new ones not the old ones but the production quality is poor to be polite it is a smaller board the cards are paper thin the miniatures are not well done i have heard i haven't tried this myself i've heard from many people just get the full version like if you want go get some ghostbuster action figures or something to replace your kids but the ghostbuster version is not worth picking up well, and that is Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. All right, up next, we have some honorable mentions. Um, I'm not going to get into as much detail about each of these, except to make, note mainly why they didn't make the list. So uh, number one, um, there's a big discussion going on about this one on Facebook right now because of a picture I shared today, and that is Zombicide. The Zombicide series of games are hugely popular, cool mini or not, I would go so far as say overproduced miniature filled games. These are the games where they come with like 126 figures and you get Stephen Hawking's miniature and like, it, it's just crazy the amount of minis and characters and expansions for these games. There are a lot of people out there that love these series. Um, I've tried a couple of them. I played Invader and Black Plague and I found them to be fun, but repetitive. They weren't great. Uh, it's the same problem I found with Cthulhu Death May Die. There is no campaign play. It's sit down, and play the adventure and you go to the next part and you start over again and you even like the first mission of invaders you find the super weapon but then you don't have it in mission two that just bothered me um it's definitely a neat co-op kind of puzzle game but not for me there are people out there that love them so i did want to throw it on here for fans of the series there are a lot of people who like on the side yeah they are in in fact uh simon was joking that uh the other day someone had asked about uh some some halloween games and uh, Simon had Zombicide on their list twice uh, because it was that good. Um, there you go. And I want, I'm going to actually slip one in here as well. And I, this is going to be an honorable mention because I know you don't have it. So you haven't played it yet. Yep. But the Halloween expansion for King of Tokyo would be right up your girl's oh. alley. Yeah, I just, I, we don't play King of Tokyo that often. That's the problem. We don't, that, that's a, we have to have more people. I don't like King of Tokyo four or three player. It's right. okay. To me, you need like the five or six. You need right. a big group. And we just don't get a big group often enough. But yeah, it is a cool expansion. And if you want to talk about cool, low-cost expansions that are just neat for Halloween, the Pumpkin Trains for Ticket to Ride. That is one of the neatest, cute expansions. All it is is replacement trains. And actually it has for Ticket to Ride Europe, it also has the stations for it. You get little pumpkin trains and little stations that you can replace your playing pieces for, for Ticket to Ride. So there, there's another, that's a neat, quick pickup to turn one of your existing games into a Halloween game. There we go. And so that was uh, King of Tokyo, the Halloween expansion, and uh, the pumpkin expansion for Ticket to Ride. Which I, I'm sure has a specific name. We actually, I think we might we might be able to give away a copy of the pumpkin expansion. <laughs> Maybe that's what we give away next week. We were Maybe. talking about giving away a game during our Halloween AMA. Maybe we'll give away the pumpkin expansion if we have some left. So next, I have, I would grab it, it's almost in reach. Uh, we were talking about the Coded Chronicles games earlier tonight. I have the next game in that series uh, sitting here from the op. This isn't published yet. I'm getting to get an early look at it. And that is The Shining Escape from the Overlook Hotel. Now, I don't know what it is with Coded Chronicles coming out with the same name as other games because there's already a The Shining board game from Prospero Hall. This is not that. This is The Shining Escape from the Overlook Hotel. The escape, I think, is going to be the key word here. This is the second Coded Chronicles game that started with Scooby-Doo. Um, based on how much we love Scooby-Doo, I expect to dig The Shining. The only reason it's not on the list is we haven't actually had a chance to sit down and play it, but I think it'll be on there. No, this one's not going to be family-friendly. This will be just probably Deanna and I playing through this one. Yeah, no. And I, I actually had difficulty finding it on Board Game Geek, uh, probably in part because there isn't a lot of traffic to it yet. But if you just type in The Shining, this one doesn't actually always show up. Um, oh, that's, so, maybe uh, it's still in pre-release. It, it's on Board Game Geek. I did find it. I did get, I did get the box art I needed. 
But uh, until I typed in escape or, or really looked around, mm. it was hard to find. Um, unlike the Scooby-Doo one, where I, if you type in Scooby-Doo, the escape yeah, one is up. the first one that shows up on my list. So that is... So yeah, it might be a little hard to find. Yeah, that is The Shining Escape from the Overlook Hotel. All right, next is Arkham Horror the Card Game. This one I am tossing on the list because everyone else seems to love it. As usual, while doing these lists, I always take a bit of time to do some research. Usually I make my list, and then I go look around and see if there's anything I missed. And I got to admit, Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters was one of those. I saw that, and I was like, oh, there's a dull moment. Like, how did I miss that? It's my favorite kid's game. One of the games that is on, like, every list, every list of top horror games has Arkham Horror the card game. Now, this is a cooperative living card game from Fantasy Flight Games. I haven't played it myself, so I couldn't tell you, but everyone else seems to love it. I tend to stay away from the living card games. Just too much money having to buy expansions that just keep coming out. And that is Arkham Horror, the card game. Finally, we have Warhammer Chaos in the Old World. This is one I do have, and I love. This is a great game. This is a super asymmetric game. One of the first games that really pushed asymmetry to the limit where every player plays one of the different gods of chaos who are doing horrible things to the Warhammer world. What's brilliant here is the goal, the end game goal, what you are getting victory points for is completely different depending on which of the four chaos gods you play. Corn, of course, you get God, uh, things for killing people and Zinch is for getting spells out and corrupting people and Slanesh is getting more people on the board. It's fantastic. The reason this one's not on the list is there's no one out there that's going to be able to find a copy of this for any price, any sane person to be willing to play. Fantasy Flight lost the Warhammer license, boy, like five, six years ago at this point. So good luck trying to find a copy of this one. But it's going to be on here just because it's such a great game. So if you have a copy, break it out for Halloween. $180 US on uh, eBay. Is that used or new? Uh, that's opened. Yeah, I so. was gonna say that's, that's <laughs> low for yeah. you. So uh, yeah, it's a it's a pricey one, and that is Warhammer Chaos in the Old World. Well, that's it for our Halloween horror filled game recommendations. We're gonna head over to the lobby and see if anyone in our chat room has anything spooky to add to our list. All right, so we've got uh, Ryan's asking Cthulhu Wars. Is this is that the same Reese rule set? It's supposedly similar, but not the same. I don't, I know it was based on Chaos in the Old World, but it was not, like, it's not the same designer. Eric Lang's the one that did Chaos in the Old World where Peterson Games did Cthulhu Wars. Right. And I, I highly doubt they just copied Eric's game. I, I would have heard that if it happened, but it does have the, you each play a different Elder God and you're trying to control territories on a map. So there's some overlap, but it isn't just like the same rules overlaid as far as I understand. Right. Cthulhu's just not as cool as Warhammer though, either way, so. And it's That's called a personal opinion. the uh, the Ticket to Ride expansion is Ticket to Ride Halloween Freighter. It was a limited edition 2012 release, and oh. Board Game Geek listings currently have it as a hundred euros to uh, get. Maybe we, we should sell copies <laughs> we have less than because we do have some. As so, far as I know, we, we we had a pile of them. They were we've been using those as extra life giveaways for years now, and people like last year were like, "Yeah, hey, yeah, I've seen these before." So I know Jeff Seuss, I don't know if he's still in the chat room, had posted a couple things on our Discord, some recommendations. I don't know if you want to grab that or if Jeff's yeah, here. Yeah, let me just, uh, well, Jeff's, um, having, Jeff's having some trouble tonight getting into our, uh, getting 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 our stream. So I'm going to oh, hop in here. Uh, Dread, of course, is fantastic and still in print for RPGs. Yeah, so this is one thing I did not cover RPGs tonight. Uh, that That is a caveat. We probably should have said that at the beginning because <laughs> we did call it Tabletop Terror. But I am reviewing an RPG later, so that's part of why I kept that there. I, I don't know any modern horror RPGs except, well, Alien, which I'll be reviewing later. But, like, uh, I haven't kept that. Right. And Jeff, Jeff's mention for that would be the hot horror story game would be Ten Candles. See, I know uh, of that game. You play it like you light ten candles at the start of the game, and when the tenth candle goes out. And eclipse then, phase is considered horror? That's Ryan's claiming eclipse phase is considered horror. I don't think transhumanism is horror to me. Personally, I think eclipse phase is a fantastic next step from Cyberpunk 2020. Right. It's taking things to that next level and adding a more sci-fi element to it. And, and for everyone those, tells me that's transhumanism. For those fans of the game, Call of Cthulhu is in its seventh edition. Seventh, uh, wow. 
Uh, and uh, according to Jeff, I will quote him here because I won't, I won't admit this. GURPS Horror is still the best how to run a horror game book out there. You know what? I've heard that. It's written by Ken Height. So that would make sense. Ken Height is a brilliant horror author uh, who has written a ton of stuff for Pelgrane Press, Knights Black Agents, and Dracula Dossier, and lots of Cthulhu stuff. I can totally see that. Right. Uh, what else have we got here? Um... Apparently there's some great uh, uh, DCC horror uh, out there that can be found. Did we get any board game recommendations? I think we did. Uh, Letters uh, from Whitechapel, if I remember. Yeah, I'm just trying to sort of scroll through. Uh, which is a game I've never played. That's a that's a Jack the Ripper, which I guess fits. Uh, Mansions games. of Madness. Yep. Eldritch got Horror. Eldritch Horror is, is, is the Cthulhu games I don't like. I don't know. Right. I'm not a huge fan of uh, Eldritch Horror or Arkham Horror, the original games myself. I do hear Eldritch Horror plays quicker. The the move around the map a lot, trying to find the right things. I don't know. I found the game very random myself, but there are definitely a lot of fans out there. Mountain Pop is mentioning Dead of Winter. Yeah, that's that will never be on my list because I played three times and never once got to interact with a crossroad card. And the entire point of the game was supposed to be this really cool crossroad card system. And the fact I could play three times and not get to see the thing that's supposed to be cool about the game, I had no interest in playing the game after that. Now, again, lots of fans, lots of people. I, From what I understand, I'm the exception that it's just rare that that would happen. But there's a part in that game where wherever you go to do something, the player to your left draws a card. And if you do the thing that's on that card or your name's on the card, a cool thing happens to you on your travels. And that never happened in three games. That never happened to me once. And I'm like, well, the whole thing's supposed to be this cool crossroads card thing. And I didn't even get to see it. And to me, that I just that's a game I honestly think is broken. Right Now, I know there's an expansion. Maybe that fixes it. Plus, it's also a social deduction game. And I think most fans of the show know I'm not a fan of social deduction in the first place. So a social deduction game where I didn't get to see the cool part wasn't for me. But we will definitely toss that on the list. Um, they probably won't end up in the blog post, but we'll definitely throw them in the show notes. Uh, and then also, so we've got uh, Betrayal at Mystery Mansion, the Scooby-Doo one. Uh, oh, and, see, I want to try that. I haven't. I, I have no clue. And Fury of Dracula was Jeff's last uh, suggestion. All right, Fury of Dracula. I owned the original from Games Workshop, published in 1986 or so. That is really unique game, um, where it's a, one of those hidden role, kind of like um, Toronto, Scotland Yard. So Dracula is like moving around the board. You can't see him and the other people are trying to hunt him down and he can send like minions to attack and that it is really neat looking game that they have now put out like five different editions and I never played it. Like I owned it and I never played it. I just, I don't know. I think you needed exactly four players with the original and that was hard to find. Right. Uh, Ryan's calling out a touch of evil. Um, all of the games from that series, I have not played any of them. The Twilight Creations, I think, is the company that does Touch of Evil. Uh, I have not tried it. Or is that the Evil Hat one? Uh, Flying Frog Productions. Yeah, Flying Frog. Okay. It's a company that uses actors for all their artwork, and it just, to me, looks really silly. I know some people dig it, but like it's like people in cosplay for all their artwork. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know. I haven't tried any of them. I've heard good things. So, unfortunately, that couldn't be on my list. So I haven't tried it. Yeah, no, it's 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 a choice. You know, they they they're doing their own photography, yes. obviously, and and yeah. and it's a it's a choice. It's a but, dedicated choice, and they stuck yep. with it for all their games. Yep. Um, but I, I, I think that I guess. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it gives it a certain feel. There's no doubt, doubt about that. Oh, I guess one of their games, Conquest of Planet Earth, is all art. Oh, okay. Okay, all the ones I had seen <laughs> have been like cosplayers. And there are a lot of um, touch of a touch of evil, like yes, yeah, like uh, what is the expansion list? Eleven expansions for a touch of evil. Um, although some of that apparently, is, yeah, some of that is soundtrack, so it's not actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a problem with board game geek because you get like all the promos and stuff like that. Yeah, it's no, they're definitely popular. I watched one of them get played on. Um... Well, Wheaton's Tabletop, and it didn't look like my kind of game. Right. There were games I wouldn't put on the list specifically. Oh, and there was well, a 10-year example... anniversary edition of Touch of Evil, actually, yeah, that came out this year. So. We owned one of their games that actually had a wind-up zombie. You, like, put stuff out, and you wind up the zombie, and if it walked into your character, it was kind of silly. We had some older ones on the list, too, that I don't have anymore, like Spooks and Brains. 
just games have evolved. Like they were neat, cute games. One was a trick taking game where you collect brains. Yeah, Fountain the, Pop uh, agrees with the Crossroads thing being kind of broken in Dead of Winter, but still enjoyed the rest of the game. The reviews for the Touch of Evil 10 year anniversary are very much people who enjoy the franchise. I'll just yeah. put it that way. That doesn't surprise <laughs> me. All, All right. right, I think we got enough to go on. I think we can uh, move on because mainly I kind of need... Yep, stuff. same here. Finally, if you've got a game night question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email me directly, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. <laughs>